Okay. Ah, uh, there we go. Good. I didn't want to have to yell for 45 minutes. It sounded bad idea. Um, so I, I also wanted to thank everyone for, for accommodating me, uh, as it appears that I will be in Dallas for a few extra days. <laughs> um, my wife was very unpleased when I walked out the door this morning, um, knowing that there's going to be maybe three feet of snow dropped in my house tomorrow and the next day. But I'm happy to be in here in this weather. So. <laughs> I also wanted to thank, uh, thank Sarah Sage and the English department for coming up with this lovely image that I'm planning to use for lots of talks now. Um, I think it's lovely. So. Most broadly, uh, my work is concerned with the convergence of religion and print culture and technology in the mid-19th century. This Courier and Ives illustration, published in 1876, hmm, this is very dark. Can we, can we maybe turn the lights down a little bit more so we can actually see some detail? <coughs> Particularly these. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this um, this Courier and Ives illustration titled "The Progress of the Century" uh, aptly illustrates the new technologies that reshape the flow of information during the period. There's the steam press, the telegraph, the railroad, <coughs> the steamboat, which all contributed to new modes of reading that relied on ideas of simultaneity and mass audience that were inconceivable only decades before. If we zoom in on the paper that's emerging from the telegraph operator's machine, we can see a clear example of how, for 19th century Americans, ideas about technology were tied up with both politics and religion. The illustration asserts that steam engines and electrical wires bind the nation together, quote, liberty and union now and forever, and reflects the millennial hopes with which antebellum Christians often invested technologies that could spread the word of God faster or to more readers. You see it says, glory to God in the highest, the Annunciation. John Walsh has observed that in the 19th century holds a special attention for digital literary scholarship because the age so closely parallels our own. The Industrial Revolution is, quote, the closest analog to the rapid technological and social change of the digital era. The new mass media of the period produced more information than could be processed through traditional means such as reading. Modern information overload, then, perhaps begins in the 19th century. With modern humanities technologies, however, this overload can be an asset to scholarship rather than a liability. And so today what I want to do is I want to start small with a chance discovery made in an obscure archive. That discovery opened for me questions familiar within literary studies and led, through the assistance of te textual, geospatial, and network analysis technologies, to new kinds of questions that I think can enhance our understanding of the United States before the Civil War. So I'm going to move from my work on this single text to a discussion of how similar texts might help us better understand 19th century culture, print culture, writ large. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this, this initial discovery of a, a text called The Celestial Railroad by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, not a lot of scholars really talk about the Celestial Railroad anymore when they talk about Hawthorne. It's a, it's a parodic rewriting of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, in which modern technology has intervened. Um, the the, path, the uh, slaw of despond has been paved over. Uh, instead of discarding your sins at the foot of the cross, as Bunyan's Christian has to do, you can put, it in the, put them in the baggage car so that you can claim them at the other end of the route. But of course, all of these modern improvements in the story lead not to the celestial city, but to hell at the end. Right? And it's the old-fashioned pilgrims who refuse the railroad who are able to make it to the celestial city where the narrator is led uh, astray. So the first time I found this, I was doing archival research on 19th century apocalyptic movements. This is what I was studying for my dissertation. And I was reading newspapers uh, written by the Millerites. This is a group in the uh, early 1840s that predicted the end of the world. It was going to come in 1843. They, they assembled quite a following in the United States. William Miller became a sort of a celebrity preacher. And they published uh, several newspapers. They published the Midnight Cry, which was a daily newspaper out of New York. They published the Signs of the Times, which was a daily out of Boston. And they published about 14 other newspapers around the country and in Canada. And I encountered the Celestial Railroad there. And I was struck because these newspapers printed no text that we would consider literary. Unlike many 19th century newspapers, almost no poetry, certainly no fiction. Almost you know, every episode, or every uh, newspaper issue was devoted to unpacking all the signs of the times that pointed to the end of the world. It was news, it was 
uh, exegesis, that was what almost all the newspapers were devoted to. So I was very curious why this particular story would have been printed by these newspapers. I turned to the signs of the Times and found that they also reprinted the Celestial Railroad, and I wanted to know why. So I started uh, my investigation as Meredith McGill recommends one should when studying Hawthorne, I turn to C.E. Fraser Clark's bibliography of Hawthorne, which she calls the, um, the best information available due to the inadequately indexed <coughs> state of 19th century periodicals. And when I looked there, what I saw was this. I saw a fair number of reprints of the story. But I was immediately, this is more of a visualization. You don't really need to, to read all the details. Uh, what I was immediately struck by, though, is that one of the reprints that I had found was not here. And so I wanted to dig a little bit further. And so I turned to digital archives of 19th century newspapers and magazines, uh, including this one here, the Chronicling America collection, which is the, the Library of Congress's collection. But there were a range of them that I, I looked at. And in just a few weeks, I had a bibliography that looked like this. It's more than twice as long as Clark's bibliography of the story. And I also assembled hundreds of paratexts, texts that reference the Celestial Railroad, that reference the characters, the plot. Um, basically, what I was finding is that this story was so pervasive and so popular during the period that writers could refer to it without any context and assume that their readers would know what they were talking about. They could just talk about Mr. Smooth in a way, who's one of the characters of the story, without saying, you know, the guy from Hawthorne's Celestial Railroad, right? Mm -hmm. Most of these were unauthorized reprintings, and they were published in denominational newspapers, religious newspapers. <coughs> in many ways, the Celestial Railroad seemed to exemplify the practices that Meredith McGill describes in American Literature and the Culture of Reprinting, where she argues that the antebellum American experience of text was shaped by the widespread normative practice of reprinting stories and poems, often without authorial permission, in newspapers and magazines and other media. Reprinting, she argues, is a form of textual production that is inseparable from distribution and reception. Reprinted texts call attention to the repeated acts of articulation by which culture and its audiences are constituted. My experiences with these digital archives, though, did lead me to question one of McGill's, and I think a necessary working assumption from that book, which was that inadequately indexed 19th century periodicals meant that bibliographies were the best information that we have available. I was thinking that this is perhaps no longer true, right? which is to say we have better information that we can get at. And I began to wonder how we might begin uncovering and representing more comprehensive pictures of textual exchange, amendment, response, and what Leslie <coughs> Thorne Murphy calls reauthorship. Uh, Thorne Murphy notes that we would be well served to develop strategies that allow us to piece together aspects of authorship, editing, and co-authorship that shape these texts. So for me, these um, aspects combine into something that I begin to refer to as, as viral textuality. Borrowing a more recent term that describes not simply reprinting, but larger ecosystems of reading, sharing, reprinting, reaction, appropriation, and remixing. As a descriptor, viral describes the, the impact of text, however you want to delineate the text, as signals of larger cultural and technological systems. So uh, just briefly, what do I mean by virality? And of course, I'm going to show a picture of my children. <laughs> I think I'm actually contractually bound to do this from this point on in my career. Um, but, but what do I mean by viral? I, I mean things that are widely shared. And I'm using this word. <laughs> I'm using this word shared deliberately because I'm talking about sort of both official reprinting and recirculation, um, but also uh, reader-driven recirculation. Right? A lot of these viral texts, you find uh, that the editor says something like, our readers have repeatedly solicited us to reprint this text, and so we are. Right? Um, I'm also talking about things that have a kind of a cultural resonance, that tap into uh, larger cultural themes or ideas. And a viral text can be something that sort of starts those themes, right? that, that gets reappropriated, or it can be something, uh, we were having this conversation, I was having a conversation with one of the grad students here that was really enlightening earlier. It can be something that taps into a theme that another text has established, right? It can be, it can be propagating the signal, if you will. Uh, 
And, and finally, uh, viral texts are often remixed or remade. Right? They, they are reappropriated themselves and turned into new texts. And these are just a few of the many uh, reappropriations of our particular viral text that, that have appeared in the past week or so. <laughs> So if we're thinking historically, uh, viral texts can tell us quite a bit about anti long readers and editors, and they can help us understand these larger uh, social, political, and technological contexts that shape print culture. So I'm going to illustrate what I mean through five points, uh, which, each of which addresses textual virality at a different level, from the single text read very closely to an entire corpus read at a distance. So the first thing I want to say is that viral texts, whether they're news stories or short fiction or poetry, are, are much more than historical curiosities. The texts that antebellum editors chose to pass on to their readers are useful barometers of the priorities, concerns, and interests of their readers, which often differ from the priorities, concerns, and interests of the text authors. The history of the Celestial Railroad, for instance, re reveals the central influence of evangelical editors and readers in shaping antebellum print culture. Denominational papers lauded the stories, rich stories of instruction, the, the moral it teaches, and its admirable commentary, while being, quote, repeatedly solicited to republish it by their readers. It was, quote, a startling, impressive little work, worthy to be a sequel to Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and a remarkable satire on worldly religion. Most tellingly, as I've said, the scenes and characters become so familiar that they can be referred to offhand. And uh, I'm not going to go into great detail about this. I have an article coming out specifically about the Celestial Railroad. Uh, geez, any week now it's coming out in Digital Humanities Quarterly. Um, but there's a real sense that I've uncovered in my research that Hawthorne was uncomfortable, actually, with the way that the story had been appropriated by religious readers. Um, he seems to have uh, rejected that reading of his story. But again, I don't know that it matters. Right? <laughs> this is how readers uh, read the story, and that's interesting to me in its own right. Um, so just some of the things that I found, just very briefly. As the story moved around the country, it was changed in dramatic ways. Uh, the visualization here is not as dark as I would like it to be, but you see these little lines here in the center. Here I'm using a, a bit of software called Juxta, which is a version comparison software that will highlight the, the differences between different versions of the same, ostensibly the same text. And it will give you even statistics about how different they are. And what we find is that different versions of the Celestial Railroad uh, were, were dramatically altered from Hawthorne's original. Uh, the most extreme version of this is, a, is one that was published as a tract, also by the Millerites. And you see it has a much longer name, Celestial Railroad or Modern Pilgrim's Progress after the men of Bunyan, vividly represented by the present day professors of religion from the original by Nathaniel Hawthorne with additions and alterations. <laughs> And they actually publish this, uh, this is on the, on the inside cover, is a long, basically, caveat explaining how little of this is actually Hawthorne's. And if you run this through Juxta, you see that actually 78% of the text is not Hawthorne. Right? That's how dramatically altered it was. But we still have the title, we still have Hawthorne's name sort of attached to it. Right? Um, the other thing that I find very interesting is that the story itself, remember it was a satire on, on modern worldly religion, and what, what I find is that papers would reprint it basically with an eye towards the church across the street, right? And so the Baptists would reprint it for the Presbyterians to read because they saw themselves as the old-fashioned pilgrims who were doing it right, and they wanted to instruct those who were not like themselves. And so actually the National Intelligencer picks up on this, and he says, the Celestial Railroad had a wide popularity because the idea corresponded to the prevalent suggestions in many minds, but it was so general that it did not take sides for or against any sect. So it could be freely used by every sect against the rest. It was therefore eagerly printed in all church newspapers. Banner, casting it at Herald, Advocate at Independent, Inquirer at Quarter, and so on. Right? And there's actually a few really uh, lovely examples. The, these are two reprintings in the newspapers in Boston, well, Boston and Cambridge. Uh, and basically, they're both literally throwing the text at one another. In, in the Cambridge Palladium, they said the article was, re was recently published by Brother Himes. That's the... That's the editor of this newspaper, Brother Himes. And they say, we wonder if this last mentioned brother, if he should look carefully, would not see his own reflex, face reflected in the looking glass somewhere. Right? So there's the, the kind of, the, the text was used to, to, to battle 
All right, so if you want to know more about this text specifically, I'm building a digital edition of it here at celestialrailroad.org. And again, uh, there's an article coming out soon. I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A, but I want to move on and think about some of the principles that this particular story illustrates that are, that are portable to other, uh, other, um, other texts. <coughs> so the rapid and widespread distribution and response to a story like the Celestial Railroad was enabled by social, technological, professional, political, and religious networks. <clears throat> Such as those that Ellen Gruber Garvey describes in her recent book, Writing with Scissors. The exchange editors that Garvey describes, who are sitting there waiting for text that they can cut out and repaste into their newspapers, represent a significant capital investment in textual sharing practices and perhaps this is what Hawthorne meant when he referred to the pamphlet and piratical system that was breaking up all regular literature, rather than complaining about individual pirates. I find it telling that he's complaining of a whole system of piracy as opposed to one or two people. And um, you can see here, these are two letters, one by Hawthorne, one by his wife, um, complaining about what had happened with the Celestial Railroad, the way it had been reappropriated by, by so many people. But how can we get at these larger systems? And this is the real question I've been wrestling with lately. How might viral text help us untangle and understand these systems? Uh, most store studies of reprinted text look very much like my early work on the Celestial Railroad, where they focus on a single text, and they unpack its history to make an argument about its cultural meaning and ramifications. Such an intense focus largely springs from practical limitations. The sheer volume of printed material produced during the 19th century makes it very difficult for modern scholars to find the vast majority of texts that were reprinted. Most archives of 19th century books and periodicals provide only the most basic discovery tools for scholars using their texts. One can browse through particular periodicals or flip through microfilm hoping for a lucky find such as mine with the Celestial Railroad, but frankly, if you went at it that way, you're, you're going to work at it your whole career and maybe not find anything, right? There's just too much. Digital archives are somewhat more amenable to discovery because you can search them using keywords. And in my case, once I knew there was this text out there that I wanted to look for, what I could do is simply find key phrases from that text that I could then go dig and search for, right? But even this isn't wonderful because uh, OCR is really bad. That's the actual text file that you're searching it's behind the, the search bar. Uh, the OCR is often really rough. We're going to see an example of what it actually looks like here in a second. Um, again, because of the way that these, these practices work, they were often removing the author's name, removing the title, so you can't search for those reliably, right? And then again, you have to already know what you're looking for. To find a reprinted text, you must first know that it was reprinted and then laboriously search for witnesses using a battery of search terms across a range of periodicals. In other words, we can easily find texts that we already know were popular, but we can't find those that we don't know, right? And this is a problem for me. The vast majority of viral texts are lost to scholarship and remain undiscovered, buried among millions of scanned pages. Adding to these challenges, as I said, is the fungible quality of these texts. They change so dramatically, you don't even know what to look for. And these limitations, I would argue, tend to reinforce our existing suppositions about the period while leaving undiscovered popular texts that might reveal to us precisely what we have failed to understand about popular opinion, reading habits, and public debate in the period. So since I've arrived at Northeastern, I've begun collaborating with David Smith, who's a colleague in computer science. And one interesting conversation we could have in the Q&A, actually, is about how to form meaningful uh, collaborations of this sort. They're not easy. You have to have a question that uh, has payoffs for the, the literature scholar, in my case, and for the computer scientist. And this is actually a challenge. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going I'm to zip through slides that I've stolen from David, and I'm going to do a little bit of hand-waving. And you're going to have to trust me that the, that the, that the algorithms work. <laughs> but I want to explain to you the, the innovation that David has brought to this project, and, and we'll, we'll go on from there. So we're interested in duplicate detection, right? And David's interest in this project, he, he's really not particularly invested in the 19th century, but he's very interested in duplicate text uh, for things like uh, plagiarism detection software, for things like, um, uh, lang actually, there are applications to language translation software and things of that nature, right? So he has his own investment in the project. The challenge for us is that if you're looking at these texts, right, they, they fall in different places 
in the 19th century newspaper. They're often truncated. You get a piece of one text and a full text in another one. Again, the OCR is very poor, so you can't really rely on finding long strands of matching text. And also, many of these archives, just to explain it, the text file does not divide things by article. And so literally, if you get at the data, the data you're looking at is an entire page of undifferentiated words. Right? So this is a real challenge for duplicate detection. So what David has figured out is that there actually is a way to do this. And, and again, this is the hand-waving part. But basically, what, what, we, what we're doing, what he's doing, is taking, we've downloaded the entire archive, and in this case we're working with the Chronicling America archive because it's free and it's open, although, as I'm going to say later, we're, we're looking at other archives we might work with. We've downloaded the entire archive, and his algorithm goes through the whole thing and breaks it all into five grams. These are sequences of five words. And then it compares all of the five grams in the archive against all of the other five grams in the archive. And we say, if there are enough matches between two pages, then consider that a reprint and spit it out into our spreadsheet. Okay? This is, this is what this looks like. Remember I told you how bad the OCR is. These are matches on a, a, um, a, a temperance story by, by T.S. Uh, Arthur. He right? was a popular temperance writer in the 19th century. Um, you can see how poor this is, but because it's not looking for whole text, because it's only looking for a certain number of matching text, we can actually find reprints even when the text is really poor, like this. Because these are actually reprints, right? These are the same text in different newspapers. So what has this led to? Well, the first time we ran it in through the Library of Congress's uh, archive, we found quite a bit. <laughs> um, we found enough that it made sense to have a spreadsheet called the Top 5,000, because we've actually found about 45,000 reprinted texts in the Chronicle America collection. And when we've looked at these in other archives, most of the texts that we found there appear in other archives as well, when we do a kind of manual search. This has really been stunning, because the vast majority of these texts, as I browse through them, are things that scholars, to my knowledge, have never really talked about. There are a few familiar names that appear, but not many. Most of them are unfamiliar. Okay. So now the question becomes, what can we actually do with 45,000 texts, right? Because uh, while I plan to read some of these closely, and I've started doing that, I can't possibly read all of them closely, right? So what can we do? Well, Global Information Systems, or GIS software, uh, offers some compelling possibilities for working with reprinted text at scale. Uh, correlating print histories with spatial data uh, viral texts can be mapped to analyze their spread across the country and to build models of 19th century readership. So in his introduction to the Placing History volume, Richard White claims that relationships that jump out when presented in spatial format, such as a map, tend to clog a narrative, choking its arteries until, even if the narrative does not expire, the reader, overwhelmed by detail, is ready to die of tedium and confusion. I often start with this quote and promise people we're not headed to tedium and confusion. Um, whereas Franco Moretti argues that maps are a good way to prepare a text for analysis, that you can reduce the text to a few elements, abstract them from the narrative flow, and construct a new artificial object. And this is really important to me, actually. The map is not truth, it is a model, right? Uh, we can come back to that if you'd like. Um, that will possess emerging qualities which were not visible at the lower level. So Moretti's talking about maps that illustrate narratives, mapping all the places visited within a novel, for instance. Uh, but I'm interested in how universal <coughs> spatial data can help us understand the journeys of text themselves, their sites of reprinting, their, uh, their potential readers, the means of their distribution, and comparing those to other textual histories. Like, like Moretti's intertextual maps, these extra-textual maps can be more than the sum of their parts, and they can enrich bibliographical or textual investigations. So just a few examples, real quick. Uh, one thing that I've done is grabbed the uh, Atlas of um, uh, Historical County Boundaries, which the Newberry Library uh, provides. And, and this is actually brilliant data that gives you the shape of the country at all moments back in history. Um, and correlated this with other data, like uh, Will Thomas's Railroads in the Making of Modern America collection. This is at Nebraska, and he provides all of his data about uh, the shape of the railroad network at various points in history. Mm -hmm. If we overlay these, what we can do is we can, over, we can put a, a print history and correlate it with uh, the spread of transportation networks, which is something I began to experiment with. 
So you can see how the spread of a particular text may, uh, although there are plenty of variables here, have correlated with also the spread of the railroad network at various points in history. So here there's a, a few actually, so you can do comparative work between texts. The other thing that I'm finding very interesting is how we might use census data to get a picture of potential readers for a text. Uh, so here, sorry, that's what the, sorry, this is what the census data looks like. You can get at census data all the way back to the first census. So historical information, it's remarkably detailed, depending on what you're interested in. So what I've done here is I've created a, a 10 mile buffer around the sites of the Celestial Railroad's reprinting. And I chose 10 miles rather arbitrarily. I could have done five, I could have done 20. 10 seemed reasonable in an age before automobiles to me. Um, and then I've merged these buffers with, which I'm calling kind of potential zones of influence. I don't have a good word for this yet. With uh, the census data below them to get a picture of who might have been reading this particular story. And then we can compare different stories. So here, for instance, I've just grabbed a few sample uh, data points out of the census uh, and compared them across three different uh, viral texts, the Celestial Railroad, Pose the Raven, and Tom Snoops, which we've never heard of, but which is one of the texts that we've uncovered in our, in our text mining project. And you can begin to see who might have been able to read something, how wide might this particular text reach have been compared to the reach of other texts, like it or unlike it. So we can see that within 10 miles of the Celestial Railroad, there are 4.4 million people, nearly 800,000 families, twice as many Sunday school libraries as public, school li as public libraries, more than 1,000 Baptist churches, nearly 1,500 Methodist churches, and so on. Uh, for me, you know, it's spread in religious populations, so I'm very interested in what demographics uh, were, what kinds of churches were near the places where these were printed. Uh, there are, of course, problems with these sorts of estimates. Large cities such as New York, or Boston, or Philadelphia, uh, where the story was printed one more, uh, where it's printed many times, only count once in the way I'm doing the analysis right now, and I'm trying to figure out how they might count more than that. Uh, the data, of course, can't tell us precisely who among those 4.4 people read the story, but they can give us a picture of the markets through which particular stories circulated. By analyzing community data around many reprinted texts, we can begin testing what social variables may have affected textual virality during the antebellum period. And this is, this is more just uh, for fun, but uh, this is something I did at the UCLA Institute. I was there with Paul <coughs> And uh, this is uh, the historical counties of the United States and, and visualized over the growth of newspapers um, from, from the 17th century all the way to 2000. Um, and what I find really fascinating here, although I haven't done much of it yet, is the way that political boundaries uh, tend to follow the newspapers. Right? You have these areas that we would call the territories. We know they weren't really empty, but uh, they are at least not politically bounded. And the newspapers kind of strike out for the territories, and the political boundaries quickly follow. Um, I haven't really theorized that yet, but I find it fascinating. I think it looks nice. So. <laughs> So while geographic data can illuminate some aspects of these textual histories, perhaps most exciting is the promise that viral texts hold for untangling and modeling networks of influence among 19th century newspapers and periodicals. Viral texts point directly to influence. A text from one publication was deemed worthy enough, or worthy enough of scorn, to be reproduced by another. 19th century texts moved through intermesh networks of authors, readers, and editors, often not tied to local geography. Instead, connections were often formed through common denominational or political affiliation, or personal acquaintanceships between the author, editors, and writers, or the communications infrastructure of the railroad or postal routes or railway lines. In the postal age, David Hankins contends that both the post and the rail fostered, quote, new expectations of contact and feelings of proximity connecting physically separated parties within a shared temporal framework. For Henkin, these expectations and feelings are the most important outcome of these new technological systems. If we think of reprinted texts as strong indicators of connections between different publications, then a vast index of reprinted texts can be used to visualize those connections directly without the intermediary of a map. So this actually, this thing that you've seen a couple of times, 
is without label. It's one of the network graphs that I've been able to construct of reprinting in the period. And I'm going to move to a detail, which I, I hope that you can see given the lighting. Yeah, actually, this works pretty well. Wonderful. So one reason among many that I'm really excited to be at Northeastern is that we have a real strength at our institution in the, the field of network science. I have colleagues in computer sciences, health science, uh, political science, and other fields who are leaders in this interdisciplinary field. And I found that models of, say, modern political exchange or even epidemiology uh, pertain also to historical textual exchange. And I was telling uh, the grad students I was meeting with earlier about this wonderful meeting where I was building these network graphs with reprinting information. And in the room with me were a political scientist, a physicist, and a computer scientist, all of whom use network graphs to study really different things. One epidemiology, one political influence, and one, uh, he does mood analysis on Twitter. And they were all completely fascinated by these graphs and gave me this incredible feedback about how to sort of ask uh, more precise questions and to, to work with the data in a way that would be more illuminating. And this has been a really wonderful interdisciplinary environment for this kind of work. Uh, I found that network graphs de developed to analyze modern online social networks turn out to be surprisingly illuminating for thinking about viral text in the 19th century. So uh, here, let me just sort of explain what it is that you're, what it is that you're seeing. So the nodes, those are the circles. These, in this case, represent individual newspapers. Okay? Newspapers that we found reprinted text when we did that text mining and, and automatically found those 45,000 texts. This is using that same data. Okay? The lines between the newspapers represent shared reprinted text. So if there is a thin line between two newspapers, it means that they reprinted something once together. Right? The thicker the line is, the more often they reprinted the same text. Right? Because my hunch here is that frequency of reprinting indicates the relationship between publications. Right? And so we can draw inferences about who was reading who based on this data. So when we compare not two print histories, but thousands of print histories, we can begin to understand how this network of 19th century print culture operated. We can ask, for instance, which publications most shaped the network by analyzing whose texts were most likely to be reprinted elsewhere. Uh, what were the central publications that shaped antebellum reading taste and thus helped shape opinion? And so actually, if you want to play around, not, I see not many of you have computers. This is odd to me. Um, but th that website right there, you can play with this network graph uh, live, and you can, if you click on the nodes, it will actually tell you how many other newspapers they're connected to, how strongly, things like that. So you can see a live version of that graph, and I just showed you on the, on the website. So I, I want to end my talk with work, oh, I'm sorry. So th this is, well, you can't see this. Uh, when I was at UCLA, one of the really brilliant guys there helped me actually take a network graph and then align it onto a map which is really wonderful because it demonstrates some of the geographic connections, but some of the connections that were very sort of ageographic, which is to say you see these incredibly strong connections between things that are very far from, from one another. I found that very interesting. This is still a work in progress, but I was, I was incredibly jealous of this guy because I was sitting there working, musing, saying, man, it would be really amazing if I could take this network graph and project it onto a map. And he said, well, let me work on it. And the next day, he said, hey, I've got that thing for you if you want. <laughs> and he popped it in, and it worked. So uh, I wish I could do that. I can't do that. So I want to end with work that, that's very nascent, uh, thinking about some of the questions that are emerging for, from, for us from the, our early findings in this reprinting project. Uh, perhaps the most compelling thing to me right now is a question of genre. A significant percentage of the most frequently reprinted texts are similar to these three examples. And I'm just going to show you a couple things here. One is that, that story I told you about Tom Snoops. Tom Snoops, is, it's this funny little story about a husband who decides that he's going to defy his wife and is punished for it. And it, 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 and it ends with a pithy little lesson about how you should do that if you're a husband. And um, you know, it's kind of a Reader's Digest sort of you know, vignette. Another one that was frequently reprinted is the, uh, it's variously titled A Wife Worth Having, and also, again, you can see how the titles are shifting between these. With the Tom Snoops, you may have noticed that he becomes Tom Snoops in a later version, and then there's even a version called Tim <coughs> Stoops, although in the story, he's still named Tom, even though the title is Tim, right? So this shows you why it's important to have uh, flexible ways of finding these texts, right? 
so this, uh, William Ward is a historical personage, and this it kind of has the trappings of uh, biography, but it, it's really a temperance story. These, these are, it's about him giving up drinking because of his wife's insistence that he must. And then here, a gem, the dying wife to her husband, the following most touching fragment of a letter from a dying wife to her husband was found by him some months after her death. This is a kind of a sentimental uh, little piece. So these are really short works of prose, a few paragraphs in most cases. And what I find maybe most fascinating about them is that they have an, what I would call an indeterminate truth value. I've been debating what to call these things, anecdotes, vignettes, uh, fait divers, something that uh, scholars of French literature use to describe them as similar. Um, Edgar Allan Poe uses this lovely term, uh, bizarreries, which I would love to use, but it's not actually accurate because they're not all sensationalistic, so I don't think I can use it. We might even call them filler, <laughs> right? Because in part, what they're doing is they're filling a few column inches in the newspaper right, that, that the editor needed to fill. Uh, this is a lovely poem that uh, Ellen Gruber Garvey uses in, in her book, uh, the, the song of the editor about this process of finding things to fit the columns. Right? I, I really love this. So we might call this filler, but I, I've been completely fascinated by this, this genre. Uh, scholars have long discussed the heterogeneity of 19th century newspapers. Right? If you look at a 19th century newspaper, it includes news, it includes fiction, it includes poetry, right? it includes uh, science, you know, anything you can imagine would be included in these newspapers. Uh, authors such as Edgar Allan Poe or Richard Adams Locke exploited that heterogeneity to perpetuate hoaxes on the reading public. And, and these vignettes seem to exploit that same quality, explicitly operating in the gray area between fiction and nonfiction, enabled by the form of 19th century periodicals. Often they imply that they're drawn from life. Quote, the following most touching fragment was found by him some months after her death. Right? There's a sense of reportage that's going on there. But they read distinctively as fiction. They include few verifiable details. Where? What were their names? You know, any of this kind of stuff you could use to track it down. And the authors are usually anonymous. For many reasons, these kinds of texts fall well outside the usual purview of 19th century literary scholars. If, if indeed these vignettes prove to be central, the 19th century newspaper and periodical culture then, then they will demand closer study. The affordances of large-scale text mining make identifying the most important vignettes uh, for such a study possible, perhaps for the first time. So just really quickly here at the very end, I'm going to talk about our, our next steps, because you're really getting a peek into exactly where we are in this study right now. <coughs> So one of our next steps is new resources. We've been making headway with a lot of commercial uh, archives of 19th century periodicals and newspapers, and it looks like, uh, is this wood? I wanted to knock on wood. It looks like, it looks like we're going to get access to things like the uh, American Memory Collection and many of the commercial archives by Redex and ProQuest, which is really going to bolster this. I'm expecting not 45,000 texts, but, you know, hundreds of thousands of texts. Um, and actually, we've already got some of these. So this uh, here is actually what the Making of America collection looks like, if you just download it all. <laughs> uh, it's just lots of folders with XML, like plain text. And so we're, we're planning to dig into this next. We've also got some questions that we want to answer. We want to think about how did changes to particular laws or particular uh, new railroads, things like that, change textual sharing and reuse. We want to think about how various social, political, and religious factors shape habits of reprinting and reauthorship. Uh, what textual features specifically contributed to textual virality at different moments in the 19th century? And how did the priorities of editors and readers change over time? So one way we're getting at this is that we've now started to annotate both the newspapers and also some of the most important texts. So we have uh, some graduate students and, and myself we're going through all of the newspapers that we found and finding out who were the editors at different points in time, what were the political affiliations or religious affiliations or social uh, movement affiliations of these newspapers. Uh, so then we could do, for instance, we could see what, what do, do viral texts cross religious lines or are they mostly confined to particular religious spheres, right? Um, is there a democratic paper that's always reprinting Republican uh, news and why, right? These sorts of things. Uh, so we've begun to do this kind of hand annotation so that we can perform more nuanced analyses of the, of the network. And uh, one, well, just one real example I wanted to point out here. So this is the Fremont Journal. 
And one of its connections, a fairly strong connection, is with the Glasgow Weekly Times. And these are, these are widely uh, dispersed uh, places. And so uh, Abby Mullen, who is uh, oh, that. one of the PhD students who's working on this project with me now, uh, dug into this. She was very curious about why these two were connected. And what she found is this, these lovely connections. So Keeler and Master were, were, Master were editors, and Keeler uh, ended up marrying uh, this woman who lived in Fremont, who published lots of poems before they married in, uh, in his journal. She mailed him. She had a brother who lived there. She mailed him her poems. He got them reprinted in the newspaper, and somehow, uh, I'm curious to find out exactly how, um, she eventually ends up married to the editor of that newspaper. I guess her poetry was really, really, really good. Um, and as a random fact, she was a relative of Rutherford B. Hayes, who also lived in Fremont. I don't know that that's pertinent, but it's interesting. Um, so anyway, we started to do this kind of hand annotation to really flesh out this picture that we're getting of the period. So early insights, and these are perhaps broad, I think that they have to be at this point, but the viral texts reflect these broad cultural values, an awful lot of them are temperance narratives, right? An awful lot of them are, they, they fit into or propagate the genres that we, that we know uh, and I think they're probably central, actually, to making some of those genres uh, resonate in the culture in, in ways that we haven't understood before. They're pithy, they're portable, and when I say portable, I mean both materially, and that they're short and they're easy to copy, but I also mean ideologically. Like, not many of these are, are stories that would anger people, which is to say, I think that they can be, they, were, they are the kinds of things that, that readers can read into they can read themselves into, like the Celestial Railroad, right? Where the Methodists could read the Methodists as the heroes and the Baptists could read the Baptists as the heroes, right? Um, they, they participated in and propagated wider literary trends, as I said, and as I've said, they exemplified and exploited the hybridity of antebellum newspapers. So I, I have to give some uh, attention to the new lab, which is the center that we're building in Northeastern, where all this is going on. Uh, we do have a website, it's mostly a placeholder website at this point, but uh, we'll tell you some of the folks who are involved. Those are all the people who have been involved in this project, as I hope you've been able to tell from this talk, this is not a project I have undertaken on my own, and couldn't, right? There's been a lot of people involved. Our, so here's where I want to end. Our most ambitious aim for this reprint discovery project is to develop a model or a set of models that can describe 19th century virality. By addressing these texts at many levels and with a range of tools, we can study what textual features assisted or impeded texts going viral within the network of 19th century periodicals. Using topic modeling, for instance, to sketch out the typical features of sentimental fiction, we might track those features within our set of reprinted texts to see to what extent a text's sentimentality affected whether or not it was reprinted. We might also ask what political, cultural, or social factors shape a text's reception within the wider networks that we're seeing, or within smaller textual communities. Uh, I'm particularly interested in tracking whether religious texts circulated differently from secular texts, identifying publications that passed texts between the religious and secular presses, and isolating specific features that made religious texts more or less likely to circulate outside of religious publications. So I want to evoke again Nathaniel Hawthorne's complaint about the pamphlet and piratical system that he saw breaking up all regular literature. Literary scholars, even those who have so usefully challenged the makeup of the literary canon, have long focused on regular literature, in part because our tools of study haven't given us adequate purchase from which to examine the larger systems through, alongside, or against which literary production operated. New approaches such as geospatial and network analysis may offer such purchase. Such research can complement close study of text and help scholars grapple with the big, sometimes unwieldy history of the antebellum print market, which was for its time as unchecked, unruly, and culturally disruptive as the internet is today. Thanks.
meaningless as filler and not really that important, but really should be shaping the way we understand the lived experiences of those texts contemporarily. And on a more practical level, would there, in your experience, be a way to track that theater performances? So, well, I will confess I don't know as much about theater in the period. Um, I've done a little bit of research back when I was working on the Uncle Tom's Cabin in the American Culture Archive when I was a graduate student. Um, but I, so I'm going to answer your question in a roundabout way, which is that this is a very recent thought, and I've actually been uh, I've been casting my mind back to the very first article that I ever published, which was about the way that temperance tropes uh, appear in both Uncle Tom's Cabin, abolition and abolitionist novel, but also in anti Tom novels, pro-abolition novels that appeared in response to Uncle Tom's Cabin. And I was really fascinated by the way that these, these scenes that were as prevalent in temperance literature, the, the, the wife falling to her knees and begging her husband to reform, also appear uh, in, in these moments of sort of begging the husband either to uh, renounce uh, slavery. You have this scene with uh, Sinclair and Uncle Tom's Cabin where Uncle Tom actually falls to his knees and it begs for his soul, basically. Um, and, but then also in these uh, anti-town novels, you have very, the same scenes where the wife falls to her knees and begs her husband to uh, cast off the fanaticism of abolition that has kept him away from his family and you know, is, is leading them into poverty. And as I've been doing this project, I've been thinking about how one might even think of this as an instance where a longer media form is appropriating things we might consider sort of short viral texts perhaps as a way to sort of tap into uh, cultural enthusiasm about these particular uh, vignettes. I mean, these are little vignettes that appear in these longer works of fiction. And so uh, I'm literally talking about things that I, I was writing about uh, like three days ago at this point, so it's really unfelt. But um, I, I think I'm gonna return to that. And, and maybe, so to come back to your, the theater, um, I think there would be a way of thinking about how particular kinds of virality worked in other media as well, like the theater. But I can't speak specifically to viral theater performances. It's not something I knew much about. Thank you so much. So. I grew up in a, a rural uh, southern evangelical church. So did I. And every summer, we would have visits from the local, uh, well, not the local, from an evangelist who would come through town. And every summer, we heard some variety of the same roughly 20 stories that would be retold, you know, uh, not biblical stories, you know, vignettes, these sorts of things we've been talking about. Yeah. And what this makes me wonder is, is two things. One, uh, is there some relationship between the sort of evangelical uh, appropriation of stories for sermonizing that I'm familiar with from my growing up, which, which I assume must be much older than 1980-something in the, in the American South. And two, uh, if there is some relationship between the propagation of these texts through these newspapers and the revival circuit, where these uh, revival preachers are actually going from town to town and from church to church, and, and if that's something that you guys have any plans on uh, looking into. Yeah, so you're, you're touching on one of the things I'm most interested in, right? I mean, the, the Celestial Railroad itself became one of those stories. It, it was printed as a tract by the American Sunday School Union. Um, without Hawthorne's name, they took Hawthorne's name off of it, and they added illustrations, and then printed it, and they changed the title, but it's the same story. Um, and it was printed as a tract well into the early, uh, early 20th century, actually. And I've also found examples of it being a sermon, where it was literally the sermon text, right? Um, that there's a sermon called a shock of corn. Uh, anyway, the, the primary text of it is actually this issue. Um, and of course, you, if any of you have sat in a sermon, you know that it often starts with, I've heard a story about, you know, it's kind of illustrate the, the point of the message. And so I think there probably is a, a real relationship here. Or that I think as we start to expand into, so a lot of the sermons that I found, I found in, in book corporate, like Google Books, where you actually have collections of sermons, right? Uh, it will not surprise me at all if once we begin to expand into other corpora, we find that a lot of these stories uh, appear in sermons or in some version. So I should say one of the next iterations that we're hoping for this is to move beyond straight reprints and to actually see if we can also uh, take it one step further and identify um, summaries and illusions, right? So a sermon version of a story is going to be different, but is there a way we could actually automatically find that? Um, my colleague thinks that there probably is, and that would open up a, another giant uh, 
uh, question, a <laughs> series of questions. Wow, so many hands. Uh, Steve Barker. Uh, is, is anybody in the lab working on visual text as well? I mean, I know you, you, this is all OCR recognition, but is anybody working with, uh, I would say, political cartoons or other kinds of imagery? The stuff with the display or, or images like that? Um, there's no one in our lab that's working on that. And, and actually, with images, um, there is there is work that's done out there to identify uh, similarities between images. Um, I don't know anyone who's doing this kind of work on um, older images. They would be fascinating. Carol, sorry. This is a, this is a really minor question, but I'm First reprint appears literally within days of the original. Uh, our data set, of course, is, is very incomplete at the moment, and I'm expecting that as we. Um, so one one of the things that we've done, right, for instance, is to take a few of these texts and then to go and manually search for them in other databases. And in every case when we've done this, we have found lots of examples in those other databases. And so I know that once we get access to more data that these pictures are going to get um, much more, they're going to they're be flushed out far better than they are right now. Um, so sometimes it's quick, but there is there's a real lag. Like you've heard of you know, the long tail is this idea that people are with the internet, that things can sort of remain popular for a long time. And with these texts, sometimes the, 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 long, the latest reprint is you know, a decade later. I mean, there can sometimes be quite a, a long uh, period. Uh, Spencer Cross. So we know from Meredith McGill's work that a lot of this culture of reprinting was transatlantic. Um, are you thinking about blowing your scale and crossing the pond? <laughs> Our scale's already pretty big. Um, you know, we, we, ha we have had to impose we have had to impose some uh, arbitrary constraints, and some of them were, were deliberate. So we decided to, for this initial study, we are only looking at texts before 1860. And our, the reason for this is actually not because we think the Civil War is a particularly sort of important landmark. It's actually that we wanted to look at viral text before the birth of wire services. Um, because once you get wire services, textual sharing changes pretty dramatically. And, and as you may have seen, actually, one of the things we want to do, a kind of next iteration, is to compare what virality looks like before and after wire services. But my suspicion is that after wire services, you get things that, aren't, that don't change as much. And you would get more simultaneous, right? Because it would get sent out and everyone would re reprint it at the same time, or almost the same time. Um, so, at least for the initial pass, we said prior to wire services, we want this more organic kind of sharing, uh, is what we're interested in. Um, I could see going transatlantic at some point, but uh, <laughs> we, need, we need to perfect some of our, our methods first. Well, let's do it. Two questions. Um, at what point did copyright and the exercise of copyright start to complicate the transmission. And the second question is with regard to the kinds of changes that you uh, demonstrate in the Celestial Railroad, would I be right in assuming that the reproduction of poetry was different because of the exigencies of rhyme and meter, which would make it more difficult to uh, render differences in the texts? Yeah, so we, we have found some poems um, I, I should have, you know, I should have brought in a few of those examples. But one of the um, one of the things that we're wrestling with is I don't actually think that the algorithm is quite as good at finding poetry yet. I'm, I'm not exactly sure why. So we found some, but not as many as I know must be there. Um, I mean, I should say one of the things that we're doing, one of the reasons we have grad students working on this actually, <laughs> is to help us perfect this. So one of the one of the grad students, uh, his entire job is to find where, where we've made mistakes. <laughs> so to go through the data and find either false positives that are in the data so we can figure out why they're there, um, 
and also just to, to do some kind of searching for things that he knows, he's fairly familiar with this, that he knows were reprinted uh, that aren't in our data and figure out why they're not there. Um, so I, I suspect you're right in general, although the poems that we have found, you do get changes. You get stanzas locked off, for instance, to make, uh, I assume, make them fit. Um, you get words that change, you get other kinds of textual uh, error that get, that get introduced, but I, I suspect you're right that they can't be quite as radically transformed because it, would, uh, it wouldn't read well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we haven't done enough with poetry yet. And then, um, copyright. copyright, yeah, sorry. Uh, that really starts to matter, that, that's really another thing that changes dramatically at the, toward the end of the 19th century, right? And so that, that will be another one of those iterations. So, one of the things I'm finding about working with a computer scientist is he wants to talk iteration, right? What's the first test we're going to run? And then once we perfect that, what's, how can we iterate? How can we do another more interesting test? How can we make it more complicated from this point on, right? And so I've been thinking about iterations. And the first iteration is what we've done. And the second iteration is, is perfecting what we've done. And then the third iteration is expanding, you know, and then eventually comparing different periods and things like that. So, but really, late late nineteenth century is when copyright starts to uh, starts to interfere, and then at the same time you get things like the birth of things like the eventually the AP, you know, like the change the change the game considerably. Yeah. Um, Ryan, you made um, you, you deal with all of these various tools, and you have this huge data set, potentially hundreds of thousands of items. I'm wondering about the scalability and what you what you think about what the purpose of such work is? Is this you talk about it sort of mining? Is this kind of approach equally desirable, workable, applicable when you're going from the hundred thousand down to the, the, the single study or the single work or a group of works or an author? I mean, what what is the purpose of what you're doing? So, in the broadest terms, I think the purpose of what we're doing is trying to flesh out. Um, these larger systems that we've always known were there, but have no way to really get at. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to advocate for a kind of franco moretti distant reading it will replace close reading kind of uh, approach because I, I think that that's uh, it's not a humanist too, frankly. And you know, if we just look, if I just sort of threw out my network graph, I couldn't. I couldn't just throw out the network graph and say, there you go, print culture. Have a good night. That's how it works. <laughs> right? Um, and so what I tend, to, I tend to think of my work as is a kind of zoomable reading, right? Which is to say that there are insights that one can glean from the distant reading that, that aren't accessible at the, at the level of the individual text. And, and I think that we need to, to get there, actually. Right? We know that we've been incredibly selective and that there's, that there's insight out there that we haven't been able to uh, access. Um, but then, ultimately, you've got to contextualize, right? So if you see this amazing connection between these two far-flung newspapers, one of my favorites is that there's a cluster. Uh, the Gephi is the network software that I'm using, and, and you can ask it to automatically identify clusters of closely related nodes, right? So it's looking for uh, groups that, that seem to be have a, a, a close relationship, right? And one of the closest relationships that we have found is between uh, the a newspaper in Brattleboro, Vermont, and the name of which is escaping me. Um, you know, I need to find it. I actually have it. I think it's actually in my, in that, in that graph that I showed you. Oh, it's right there. The Vermont Phoenix. The uh, Jeffersonian Republic, which is in uh, Pennsylvania, and and the one I always bring up, I didn't bring it up this time, the Boone's Lick Times, which is in which is in Missouri, and I just like it because it's the Boone's Lick Times, um, and and my uh, Abby, the person, the, the grad student who I showed you her work earlier, has discovered that it's the Boone's Lick Times because this was like a bend in the river uh, where there was a, a sort of a trading post, and all traffic had to go through there. Right? But there's this really close connection between these three, and I find that evocative, but ultimately what it does is it suggests a question of close reading, right? I want to get in there and figure out what that relationship's all about, right? Just seeing it visualized uh, maybe helps point me too. You know, as, as in the case that I showed you before, right? We saw that connection, got curious about it, and wanted to figure out why is this connection here? But then you've got to go into the text to figure out why that connection's there. You've got to look 
we've got to look more closely. So uh, for me, I think the sort of moving between scales is really powerful and, and have, holds a lot of potential for, for uh, textual study going forward. We'll take uh, one more question. Uh, Dan Moss. It's a follow-up to the last question. It's really a methodological question. Um, uh, I uh, personally felt a bit of vertigo when I saw the Google Earth map, and then felt a bit of, I'm an I'm a English, uh, English major, and then felt a bit of um, uh, relief when you answered Kari's question by referring to a scene in Uncle Tom's Cabin, which I know. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, uh, in relation to the last question, how do you know when you uh, sort of uh, turn that wide-angle lens you're using uh, into the kind of uh, close analysis that you mentioned at the end of your talk um, and that is so familiar to me? In other words, uh, can, can you recognize uh, when you need to zoom in from this map uh, to a passage from Uncle Tom's Cabin? Um, and can you clue me in to, so I can recognize that moment as well? Uh, so. As to whether I can recognize it, yes, of course. <laughs> this, this is being taped, right? Um, so I, I don't have a, I don't have a, a magic uh, answer for you here, right? I mean, I think I think part of the reason why I feel able to do this is that I was. Though I, though I had training in these sort of digital methodologies, I still had really robust training in traditional textual studies, and um, I, I, I have faith that that training is sufficient to, to clue me into when, when one needs to look more closely. Right? Um, I don't think that we're approaching an age when folks are going to go through graduate school in English and learn GEFI and GIS and not actually read anything. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm confident that these tools are not the sort of end of literary studies. <laughs> um, I, I, did, I wrote an entire dissertation on, you know, apocalypticism and millennialism, which frankly makes me skeptical of both apocalyptic and millennial claims. <laughs> so if anyone tells me that sort of like, you know, the English uh, is dying, I say, well, you're probably wrong. And, and if someone said, we're entering a golden age of uh, study, I say, well, you're, you're also probably wrong. <laughs> I, I think that these are, these are interesting tools that offer a new purchase on the materials, but they're not going to replace uh, other methodologies. Complement, not replace. Thank you, Thank you so much.